We want to welcome John Bellinger, former legal advisor of the United States Department of State, former legal advisor at the National Security Council in the George W. Bush administration to Harvard University. John, welcome. Nice to be here, Nick. Very nice to welcome you here. Um, John, you just gave an address to students and faculty on comparing the international legal challenges that the Obama administration has confronted, that the George W. Bush administration confronted as well. And you talked about a variety of counterterrorism legal issues that have been very controversial, both in our own country but also internationally. And um, they all have to do with the war against al-Qaeda, which unfolded just after the 9-11 attacks. I wondered if you wanted to just review the major points you made to our students. Sure. Well, of course, I think it's well widely acknowledged that there has been more continuity uh, than change uh, between particularly the second term of the Bush administration and the Obama administration's first term on counterterrorism policies. You know, a lot of critics of the Bush administration thought there was going to be dramatic change, you know, end of the whole idea of, uh, of a war on terrorism, closing of Guantanamo, end of military commissions, end of law of war detention, uh, end of renditions. And in fact, the Obama administration has kept almost all of these same policies, most important of which is the idea that we're in an armed conflict with al-Qaeda, which is a legal matter, is the construct from what everything else flows. It means you can detain people under the laws of war without trial. It means you can kill people uh, in different countries uh, uh, under the laws of war. Uh, you can prosecute them in military commissions. Uh, these were all very unpopular concepts, uh, not only uh, with uh, human rights and civil liberties groups here in the United States, but Nick, as you know, with our allies, and the, particularly in Europe, who really expected that this was just unique to the Bush administration and that it was all going to go back. And of course, that hasn't changed at all. One thing, though, uh, that has changed is something that has gone really the other way is that the Obama administration has become more aggressive uh, in ramping up uh, one counterterrorism tool that had begun in the Bush administration, which is the use of drones. And of course, I am here uh, this week at a time when we've really stirred up this great national debate uh, over the legality of drones, primarily uh, for to be used against Americans, but concern also about drone strikes all around the world. This is part of John Brennan's confirmation hearing. Uh, the, I'll actually be uh, testifying on Wednesday uh, uh, on the targeted killing of Americans, and we discussed today uh, whether uh, it really is lawful uh, to for the U.S. government to target its own citizens. Under the Constitution. Under the Constitution or under the laws that have been given by Congress. And so um, what do you think President Obama should do on this issue of targeting of American citizens? Because as we talked about before, if an American citizen, a citizen joins an organization or is a senior official of an organization that has declared war on the United States, isn't there ample precedence from both the Civil War as well as the First and Second World Wars that the government does have a right to target that, um, that individual? Well, there are a whole array of different legal issues here, both under domestic law and international law for the targeted killings of anyone. When we, with respect to a targeted killing of an American, what's mostly troubling people is that Americans anywhere in the world have constitutional rights, including the right to due process before they are deprived of their life or liberty. Uh, the question is, what process is due? Uh, is the process that's due to have a, a judicial determination? That's what some people have been arguing. I personally think the Obama administration has gotten it right that a American who takes up arms with a foreign country, or in this case al-Qaeda, against the United States can be targeted uh, by its government, including with lethal force. Uh, now, the Obama administration says it has to be a high threshold that a senior informed government official must conclude that this person, in this case, has to be a senior al-Qaeda leader planning imminent violent attacks against the United States. That's a pretty high standard, and I think that uh, the, uh, the government is, is uh, uh, right in asserting the right to do that. Now, what troubles me, frankly, is less so much the killing of an American as the thousands of others who have been killed around the world with really no transparency 
the uh, and they are the drone strikes are becoming more and more controversial around the world, not only in the region in which they're used, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, but among some of our close allies who are beginning to question whether these are legal under international law, maybe even war crimes. Their parliaments are beginning to question whether uh, European countries are sharing intelligence information that might be used in a targeted killing. Uh, so I think the Obama administration is in a difficult position right now and is going to need to be providing more information both about its basis for killing Americans but frankly for use of drones more generally. One of the aspects of this very complex issue that we discussed with students here at the Kennedy School was whether or not there should be some effective uh, and reasonable checks and balances on the ability of the administration to make a decision to target mm -hmm. an American citizen. Um, and obviously there are some checks and balances within the executive branch because there are legal advisors, there's a hierarchy, but you were suggesting that perhaps there could be developed some um, checks and balances perhaps from the legislative branch or some other part of the government. Would you want to discuss that? Yeah, well, the big debate recently has been whether there should be some sort of a uh, drone court or a uh, should there be judicial review of a targeted killing of an American. And that's certainly understandable. It's, it's, it's a scary thought to many Americans that their government could target them uh, uh, without any judicial process. Um, in a war such as we've got with al-Qaeda, I, I, I don't, and I think most lawyers who really thought about this think that it's not appropriate for the court to get involved in a military targeting decision. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there shouldn't be some more checks and balances. I personally think that the appropriate check would be for Congress to pass legislation that would set the terms under which the executive branch could target an American. Uh, Thirty years ago, Congress passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act when they became concerned about uh, electronic surveillance of Americans and said, henceforth, the executive branch could only conduct electronic surveillance of Americans for intelligence purposes if it met certain thresholds. Now, in that case, they did add judicial review. I don't think in a war that it's appropriate here, but I think Congress could reasonably pass legislation that would say that the executive branch has to do certain things and then has to report to Congress afterwards if it is going to target an American citizen uh, with the use of lethal force. And so, um, and so, in essence, we would um, the administration and Congress might agree to to a legal structure, and that might guide that would that would guide the action. Well, you had a premise in your question, Nick, of the executive branch and Congress would agree to something, <laughs> which is a difficult thing. It's these a days. difficult thing these days. But you see, the you see as a uh, as both a, a attorney and also as a practitioner the need for some legal structure. I don't think it's critical. Um, right now, I don't think it is required. I think if someone were to challenge a drone strike, it has been challenged, and actually the courts have just said it's non-justiciable, that it's, that it's not an appropriate subject for a court to review. But if, if, if a court substantively were to now review a drone strike in against an American, I think they would conclude that the president has the power to do that. But as a matter of good government, I think that it would be appropriate if, if we could get Congress, inside Congress to agree, and to agree with the executive branch, uh, that it would be appropriate for there to be clear legislation defining when the executive branch can target an American. And would you extend that, John, not just to targeting Americans, but targeting foreigners using drone technology? No, I don't. I think that really does get into micromanaging uh, the president's and just the way we the president's constitutional authority absolutely and to in, in his war fighting authority we yeah. would not have Congress telling him how to how to fight a war right um, John in your presentation um, you also um, what was fascinating I thought was you went down the war on terrorism issues Guantanamo military commissions Geneva conventions drone strikes. Do you think that we've come to a point where the United States, regardless of who's in the White House, needs to, in essence, lead an international effort, well, be President Obama the next four years, to, to help modernize some of the international legal conventions that govern 
uh, the rules of war, say the Geneva Conventions? It's, it's as you know, uh, even better than I from years at the State Department, it's very difficult to negotiate a multilateral treaty and on an issue involving the laws of war or more generally or certainly drones more narrowly, it would be very difficult to do that. Um, I think there has become growing recognition amongst many countries that the state of international law and particularly the state of treaty law uh, is, is not up to these current uh, legal challenges of a conflict uh, between a state and a non-state when it comes to terrorism. So you know, what we began in the second term of the Bush administration, and which I think really needs to continue, is American leadership to reach agreement on principles uh, that maybe one day might become a convention, but one shouldn't go in immediately and say, well, we're going to try to negotiate a treaty, but to try to agree on principles on you know, what are the appropriate procedures or rules to follow when a state is in a conflict with a non-state actor. For example, is it permissible or is it not permissible for a state to target with lethal force a terrorist in another country, uh, if that con particularly if that country has consented? You know, there are some now who would say that it is unlawful uh, for a state to use force against a terrorist in another country, even if that other country consented. They would say, no, that is an assassination of someone in that other country. Mm -hmm. um, the United States would say, no, uh, that's a lawful action in self-defense, and that the other country has consented or is unwilling or unable uh, to give its consent, and that we are uh, acting in self-defense. But there's not agreement on these principles, which means that the United States right now with respect to drone strikes is on unstable legal territory. We're doing something edgy and controversial, which we are asserting uh, is lawful, but we do not have uh, international consensus on this point. So to go back to your question, Nick, yes, the Obama administration finding it, itself in the surprising position of having international criticism of its counterterrorism policies needs to work harder to persuade its allies that what it is doing is legal and appropriate, but that takes effort. Right. And, and just finally on this, you, um, do you believe this drone issue could become as controversial in the next year or two internationally as Guantanamo was 10 years ago? I do. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote an op-ed called Will Drone Strikes Become Obama's Guantanamo? Uh, and I think that it was read in the White House and that they were worried that this was not what they expected four years ago, uh, that suddenly to have a as much criticism leveled against them as had been leveled against the Bush administration. When I wrote that, I didn't really think that they would come in for as much criticism as we got on Guantanamo. Um, uh, but frankly, just in the last couple of months, uh, the, the controversy over the al killing and then the John Brennan confirmation has meant that there's really been a lot of domestic and international controversy stirred up, and the administration is really getting to be on the back foot. This could become a real problem for them in the second term. Yeah. John, a last question. Um, the United States created much of the modern international system following the close of the Second World War. We are, in many ways, the upholder and great protector of the international uh, legal system. Uh, and yet, um, there's a perception that the Bush administration, particularly in its first term, was uh, insufficiently um, devoted to protecting that international legal structure. But you told us today that President Bush, George W. Bush, actually has a remarkable record of having 163 treaties approved by the Senate, and in the last two years of his time in office, the greatest number of treaties ever passed by the, ratified by the Senate in American history. And yet President Obama, who's, who, who is someone who, is, who um, is believed, of course, to be very supportive of international, uh, the international legal structure, only has nine treaties passed by the Senate in his first term. How do you account for that difference? And how do you account for the perception of President George W. Bush's behavior versus the reality? 
an international treaty? Well, I'm glad you asked the second question because, you know, of course I have a bias here. Uh, you know, I was the legal advisor during this period of time, and we were not given a lot of credit uh, around the world or even inside the United States for things that we were doing. You know, Secretary Rice uh, was pursuing a very multilateral course, one that, you know, upheld multilateral and international institutions, international law, and she was supportive of my efforts as legal advisor. Uh, we had a lot of treaties that had been uh, un uh, uh, approved by the Senate or uh, it had not been considered by the Senate over a number of years and we worked very hard to get all of those treaties through and I think you know many people around the world just decided that the Bush administration didn't believe in international law at all so when you tell them these statistics they're stunned yeah. they're stunned and you know it's more you know certainly there were things that the administration did that were uh, critical of international law. We had a number of officials in our administration who were not keen on international law and international institutions and who had said things that were critical about particular treaties. That cannot be denied. But at the same time, indisputably, we got uh, 163 treaties through the Senate. Uh, multilateral treaties, human rights treaties, uh, environmental treaties, uh, uh, rights of the child. Uh, you know, these were, uh, these were important treaties. So there was an unfortunate perception that we were not working on these things. With respect to the Obama administration, it's a, a number of reasons why they've not had a strong a treaty record. I mean, uh, one, we really had cleared away a lot of the treaties that were in the pipeline. Right. And so there were just fewer treaties still waiting. Um, two, though, uh, while, candidly, they had paid a lot of lip service to their commitment to international law, uh, uh, when they came into office, they were really more focused on domestic priorities. International law does not have a big domestic constituency, and so they really didn't work on these, particularly in the first two years when uh, you know, they were focused on health care. Uh, and sadly, that's when they had the, the larger majority in the Senate and probably could have gotten these treaties through. Um, and, and then finally, uh, the Senate has simply changed. We have more re conservative Republican senators who are highly skeptical of treaties, of international law, and particularly of multilateral treaties. Uh, they voted down the UN Disabilities Convention and the uh, lame duck session in the Congress. Now, I think there was blame on both sides there. I think that uh, the, some of the Republicans who led the charge against it had misrepresented the treaty in unfair ways. But the Obama administration, I think, and understandably they were focused on the fiscal cliff, uh, had not put in enough effort to try to push it through. And maybe it was not such a wise thing to try to push through a controversial uh, convention uh, during a lame duck session. Uh, but it, we, we unfortunately are at a point right now where there is great suspicion amongst many Republican senators of treaties generally and a feeling that somehow international law is not real law, that it's not in our interest, that it gives away American sovereignty. Um, and it's concerning to me as a former legal advisor. I think one can be a pragmatist when it comes to international law. One doesn't have to love every treaty or every international institution, but one has to recognize that many of these treaties deliver very important rights to Americans, to American businesses that we benefit from every day and that we're not going to get from other countries unless we enter into an agreement with them. We can't just beat them over the head through the use of force. John Bellinger, thank you very much for being with us at Harvard.